sorry, uh, Sydney to talk about how to set and review objectives of play. Uh, welcome. Uh, Sydney has over 10 years of experience in simulation, crisis exercises, change management, um, and brings an entire wealth of experience in games, defense, and healthcare. <laughs> I'm so sorry about mangling that. Uh, thank you very much for speaking and looking forward to it. Oh, it's my pleasure to be here. Thank you. <clears throat> All right, I'll leave you to it. Thank you. G'day team. So um, uh, my name's uh, Sydney Icarus Bowden. Um, you can find me at Sydney Icarus if Twitter exists. Uh, and I'm here to talk to you about setting and reviewing objectives of play, um, which is my generalized approach to design goals, which helps me and my teams uh, to make better games together. But first, we're going to talk about a story with pirates and wizards. Uh, on the day in which this story takes place, I'm, of course, pretending to be the wizard. Uh, it's not the first time I've called myself by a fake wizard name. Uh, I was a kid in the 90s. I didn't have a lot of friends. Of course, I played a lot of Dungeons & Dragons with the best of them. I grew up playing these games that had really clear, like, mechanical implications, really clear rules and modelling around whether or not our magic missiles hit the target. Um, but they were also games that, that were... Uh, while they were like these fun puzzles, they also had objectives, um, both for the characters and for us as as players. There were quests that we could go on and, and XP to motivate us. There were things that drove us to um, interact with the systems of the game in front of us. Uh, and the story that I'm telling is just like that. It's just a tough different, because uh, in this story, I'm not just any wizard, I am Merlin because Merlin was the call sign of my unit in the Royal Australian Air Force, a command and control unit that supports fighter pilots in uh, delivering weapons in air-to-air -air warfare. This here is our magic missile. Um, it is an AIM-120C advanced medium range air-to-air -air missile. Uh, we call it the AMRAM. Uh, other than the name being different, it pretty much plays by the same rules as a magic missile in D&D. Um, we play with character names instead of our real ones. We uh, wear special costumes and uniforms. Um, we have rules that tell us when we hit the enemy because you don't want to fire a, a real missile at your friends. Um, and we have uh, goals, uh, objectives, quests that we're on. And to run an air-to-air -air mission, you need designers. And effectively, that was my role as a tactics specialist. I was um, first off an encounter designer. I would put together the AI, how, how the enemy would fly and fight. Um, and that would be designed around presenting a certain picture to the pilot so that they could achieve their goals. Um, I was also a QA uh, person because I would be reviewing the pilot's tactics and then we'd go back and I'd show where things broke down and, and we'd look at where those bugs were and what we could improve in the future. Um, overall, uh, I was the design team and pilots are my players. And in the game that we're playing today, um, we have this setup. Um, this is my, my friend. He's that the the topmost of those blue arrows. He's in one of those planes up in the top left. It's an FA-18 Hornet, uh, and we are going to call him Magpie. And um, we're going to call him Magpie because his his real military nickname um, cannot be repeated in polite company. But Magpie is seventy miles away from me. He's thirty thousand feet in the air, and he is getting ready to level up. Magpie's been a pilot for a long time. He's got a full XP bar. Um, he's been a, a wingman in formations for as long as I've been a controller. And this is his upgrade mission. If he passes this quest, he gets uh, authority to um, lead a formation of, of two or more hornets into battle. Uh, it's a huge step on his career, and it's a huge step for, for capability generation for the Air Force as well. This is a really important game for us. Um, but I promised that this was pirates and wizards, and this is where the pirate comes in. The topmost of those red arrows, uh, we're going to call his call sign Pirate 2-2. Uh, and we're going to call him Pirate because uh, he's a senior officer in the Royal Australian Air Force. Um, he's a fighter pilot, and I'm about to talk shit about him. And if he hears that, he's going to bomb my house. So this guy was um, the kind of pilot who would push envelopes. He would violate airspace. He would um, like push the plane to its absolute limit. He'd do whatever he had to do to get the kill. And that was because for him, he prized above anything else, like winning, the idea of winning a fight. Um, that uh, approach um, made him a very good senior officer and a very good pilot, um, but 
was difficult in the role that he's in now, which is Red Air. He's a baddie. Um, that's the reason his arrow is red. His job is to go out there and present um, the simulation of the enemy, uh, the AI, for our good friend Magpie to fly against. Um, the mission was designed to group the baddies up and then push them to a two versus three merge, which would put Magpie at weakness, uh, a losing fight, to see how he keeps his wingman safe. An important skill for a, a formation lead. But our pirate 2-2 in the north um, does something different. He cuts a maneuver called a post hole. He circles in two-dimensional space. He dives below the radar horizon. He throws out a bunch of radar confusion to make my life harder. Trades his height for speed. Uh, and once he has a confused radar picture, he disappears. Um, once he disappears, if not caught quickly, almost impossible to pick up. He's fast, he's head on, and he's against ground clutter because he's lower than, than our planes. And all of those make this a really difficult fight to take. Fighter Radar finds it really hard to pick up that specific profile. So Pirate becomes what we call a leaker. That is um, an untargeted threat that's about to engage my, um, my unit, my friend. And he does. Um, comes up from well above the speed of sound, pops up, comes over the radio and says, This is Pirate 2-2. I have a Fox 1 missile kill at 28,000 feet. I got you, Magpie 1. And Magpie 1's dead. Uh, his wingman goes to the, the 3v1 merge and, of course, loses, because why wouldn't you? Um, and then we're all out of fuel and we head home. Uh, Magpie fails his quest. He doesn't get the XP. He doesn't level up and he doesn't become a flight lead. Pirate 22 took a hard stance in the debrief. He said that um, this is warfare. Magpie's a fighter pilot. A real enemy isn't going to go easy on you and you have to learn how to fight. This is a test and you failed. Um, he also took the stance that he acted wholly within the mechanics of the game and therefore everything he did was um, uh, justifiable. And I want you to sit with the cognitive dissonance of that just, just for a second while I introduce you to this. This is an image, um, it's called The Golden Circle. It's by a guy called Simon Senek from his 2009 book, Start With Why. If you are familiar with Senek, um, I'm gonna talk sort of around his work and this is gonna be very tangential. So uh, you'll be familiar with it, but um, you'll still pick up something new. And if you're unfamiliar, we're gonna walk through it together. Um, I'm certainly not gonna reiterate his, his talk and uh, uh, I'm sure that you can find it afterwards. Um, but this is where Pirate and I disagree from a game design perspective. This is where I, as, as a game designer versus um, Pirate, uh, who took over my role as an encounter designer, um, disagree on what games should look like. Because Pirate saw the game as warfare, air combat, that's what's important to him. Because his what was warfare, his methodology is by any means necessary. Uh, in warfare, so long as you don't break literal laws or the laws of physics, you can do anything. Uh, if you ask him why he pulled that maneuver, he will tell you because it's a tactic that the enemy can use. I have a responsibility to effectively simulate the enemy. So I'm going to do it. Veteran dungeon masters uh, in the audience will recognize this as the, that's what my character would do defense. Um, and just like every rogue player that has justified stealing from their party, just like, you know, every savage barbarian who has killed the friendly shopkeeper, pirate ostensibly is framing his behavior as defending the nation when really what he's doing is being unfair. You see, um, because pirate's being driven by his what, uh, his how and his why can become ineffective and, and can drift away from the objectives of the mission that we're out there to fly. We were out there to, to help Magpie to upgrade, to help him become a better pilot. In his boredom, essentially, he focused on the wrong thing and stunted Magpie's professional development. If we assume good faith on Pirate's part, which is more than we owe him, but if we assume good faith on Pirate's part, that he wants a defended nation, he wants Australia to be safe from um, an air incursion, 
then the best way for him to achieve that is to have well-drilled pilots who work together as a team, to have effective flight leads, to have people who are capable of taking a losing merge and bringing everyone out safely. And if that is what he wants, and if that is how he's going to achieve it, then his best action is to conduct an effective training drill utilizing adult pedagogy. Instead of, instead of worrying about realistic simulation, he should be looking at specific first principles training. And the reason I bring this up is that, is that the way that he saw the world going from the what inward is how I see so many players talking about games at the moment. And that's, that's fine. Players, players don't have to have the right language to talk about games because it's not how they engage with it. It's just how they talk about it. The reason I'm bringing into this talk full of people, um, that are, that are very intelligent and very specialist in their skill set is that I'm starting to see a lot of people on the design side talk like this as well. And I'm concerned that it's going to drift us as it did with pirate into attempting to replicate the wrong things. I want you to take a look at the top nav strip that I've got up there. Um, there are three reasons that you need to set and review good design goals for your project. The first is to inspire, the second is to guide, and the third is to assess. This is the first, to inspire. When you begin thinking about a game that you're setting out to design or a piece of the game that you're setting out to design, I, I talk about fractal design a lot, and, and this is going to be fractal. Um, this can be the macro uh, of designing an entire game, or we'll talk later about the micro of designing small levels or a single character or a single, a single unit. Um, there's a habit when talking about games uh, in our community around framing it through a mechanical or a, or a genre lens. Um, you know, my game is a first person shooter. I am making a cyberpunk game. Um, this is a puzzle that we are building. Or you get that really advanced thing where people take a genre or a mechanical instance or, or um, a narrative beat and then they start slamming them together. Um, this is a survival crafting game, but it has an open world and Ubisoft towers. Um, and you know, by showing Breath of the Wild, this doesn't necessarily make bad games, but it's creating that drift. It's starting from the outside of the circle. Um, Sean Faust of, uh, Fortis Games, um, XVP of WB Games, now COO of Fortis Games, talks about this as categorization. He says it comes in the form of blaring signals that the thing that you're pitching needs to be categorized and sorted into something that's a part of something that everyone agrees is something. A pattern must be identified. What pattern does this game fall into so that I, the capital allocator, can rest assured that the thing you are pitching to me is an acceptable thing. Uh, and I don't know if it comes across taking this out of context, but Sean is specifically not a fan of this approach. Um, Sinek, who did the Golden Circle, refers to this as manipulation. Manipulation is convincing people by removing risk, and it stands in contrast to the other thing that you can do, which is innovation, convincing people that the risk is worth it. Undercutting a competitor's price is a form of manipulation. Uh, I remove the risk of you having to spend money on this product so you engage with it. And, and that works while ever you can undercut. Getting a financial backer by doing Mad Libs, by being like, oh yeah, we're going to make Fortnite, but we're going to make it in space, works. I mean, look, here's a really good example. Um, uh, Boyfriend Dungeon, uh, it's a, a roguelike dungeon crawler, but you can kiss the sword. What a, like, what a great genre pitch. Uh, and that works while ever you have the genre pitch, but it's not robust. That sort of manipulation works once and your next event, your next attempt at it will work while ever you can continue to manage that risk down, but it doesn't let you grow or innovate or expand in any way. Linking back to Forst's um, words again, this is about metrics. It's about making capital allocators happy with the work that you've done. Because that's why we all get into games, right? Risk mitigation. Stock, stock matrices. Matrices. Um, putting money in a capital investor's pocket. Like, and, and this is, this is the important thing is I don't know why you got into games. I don't know why you started working on games, but, um, I'm willing to bet that it was more for like one of these reasons. 
to inspire, explore, teach, share me. I'm uh, I'm a I'm a consultant by trade, and I didn't get into that to do PowerPoint for six hours a day. I got into um, consulting because I want to solve problems. I got into consulting because into healthcare consulting because my six year old niece may have a mental health crisis, and knowing that I can help fix the mental health system so that she receives evidence-based care instead of just being shunted into a child inpatient clinic gets me out of bed. So when someone asks you what your game is, that's your pitch. That's that outer ring. I want you to start thinking about when someone asks you why you're making your game, that's your design goal. When you want to manipulate, tell them what. When you want to inspire, show them your design goals. If there are three reasons why you need design goals, the first to inspire gets you out of bed. If your design goal does not inspire you, you need better goals. If you do not feel inspired, you need to look at why you're working on the product at all. The second reason is to guide. Game design is a set of decisions. After dragging yourself out of bed because you're inspired, you're going to sit down and you're going to make decision after decision on your Unity dashboard, on your Wacom tablet, whatever you're doing, it's just going to be decision, decision, decision. And that is exhausting. But none of them are as tough as the first decision you're going to make. Oh, a blank page. Oh, gross. Um, endless possibilities exist on a blank page and you can go in any direction and most of them are going to be bad. And if you have a mediocre scrum master at your studio, they're going to say something like, um, we build projects around motivated individuals. I trust you to find the design. And, and that's, that's nonsense, right? You can't just find the design. So they'll set you a sprint goal and it'll be a small task. It'll be something like design a level that's set in a mansion, but that is all aesthetic. That's a, that's a job, but that's a task. What you need is a design goal. You need a why. Because we're making a game that allows players to experience the joy of methodical, well-earned revenge using supernatural powers, we can lean in to the uh, subterfuge, to the political nature of methodical revenge in a mansion and throw a party. Um, in the bottom right, the players can uh, listen to the NPC's barks that tell them uh, how bad uh, the enemy is. In the bottom left, they can find a key that gives them access into a back door. And then uh, in the top left, they can differentiate between multiple targets before luring them away to put a knife in their neck. It's beautiful. It, it hits that design goal, methodical, well-earned, and it has um, enough exploration for that, for the supernatural powers. Or we can have a mansion with dynamic vertical level design. Uh, in the bottom right, um, this clockwork mansion is an ornate, sprawling trap that moves that players have to develop a mental model of. Uh, in the bottom left, we can see multiple avenues of entry uh, and sprawling verticality. And in the top left, in this one, we have a, a combat scenario where a player can challenge themselves against, um, against a really, really difficult combat uh, event to get access to whatever's behind it and in that door. Now, the thing that I want to point out that's really interesting is that both of these hit that design goal really perfectly. Both of these are wonderful designs. Both of these work. And these are two of the best um, levels from their respective games. But the thing that really is valuable to me is that if I, as a project lead, um, gave that brief to people and my writer goes off and makes Lady Boyle's last party and my level designer goes off and makes the Clockwork Mansion, those two are not incongruous. I can run. I can I can merge those two. I could run Lady Boyle's Last Party as a set piece in the Clockwork Mansion because they both align with the same design goal. For project leads, this ensures that your work is interconnected. And for people who are doing the work, for Coalface um, technical producers, this is going to help you get something on a blank page. And this is what guidance is about, not restrictions, but as big, heavy points 
that deliver gravity wells. This is what sense-making expert um, Dave Snowden calls an enabling constraint. He says, um, laws and rules and codes create governing constraints. They give a sense of stability, but they're sensitive to change. They're not resilient. Heuristics and principles, what we're calling design goals, on the other hand, uh, provide guidance while allowing for distributed decision-making. And I love the image that he uses on the, on the left most, um, which is those principles where we see their gravity well. And we see ideas flowing between them and we see that innovation expression coming out. Whereas those governing constraints, that's the bridge, they narrow you in. And as you can see with that one, one line that's looped back around, if your governing constraint doesn't fit within the narrow, um, or if, you, if your idea doesn't fit within the narrow pathways of your governing constraint, um, you lose it and you can't iterate on it. Whereas using them as gravity wells lets you move things close to it and let them get drawn into each other's power. The key to the difference between these two is that a governing constraint is based in the what, whereas a, uh, an enabling constraint, um, a guiding constraint is, is rooted in that why. So if you want someone to understand why you're making your game, you tell them your design goal. If you want someone to understand how to help you make your game, you tell them your design goal. But there are three reasons to set design goals. The first is to inspire, the second to guide, and the third is to assess. Once it's designed, once that level designer puts that work in front of you as a, as a, as a project lead, or once you finish your work and you want to review it, once it hits playtest and QA start giving you feedback, how do you know if it's good? In fact, once your game ships and you're reading the Rock Paper Shotgun article afterwards, how are you going to know if you've succeeded? I hope not. I promise you that if you spend a career chasing Metacritic scores and sales numbers, you will fall to manipulation. You will stop innovating and you will start chasing. You will make X, but with NFTs. You will make, um, uh, you will do arbitrage. You'll, you'll make last summer's hit that with, and you, you, it'll be Malibu Stacy, but with a new hat. Or you'll make Diablo Immortal. And like, you will try and you might even get a win. Like you might make some money off it, but you will not build an audience. And the next thing you will launch will be uphill again. You will not create trust. Diablo Immortal is the joke, but it's, but it's also real. And if you need any more evidence, I would love to talk to you about Fallout. Fallout's a great example. They had an audience that followed them because they believed in the design goals. They went from Interplay to Black Isle Studios to Bethesda Softworks, then Obsidian, then back to Bethesda Softworks. And I mean, actually, let's not even talk about, about, about developing studios. Fallout 2 was an isometric tactics game. Fallout 3 was a first person shooter and their audience followed them. Their audience grew. That's because what held them together was not the aesthetic of a of an isometric turn-based game. It was the energy of the environment, of the world, and of, of the people that inhabited that world. And that's why different um, developers can work on them. And that's why why different um, invi like where they can travel around to different cities in the US and why they can present it in different ways. And that is why when Fallout 76 launched, one of the biggest complaints was no NPCs. Now, no NPCs is a complaint that's in the what sphere, but it wasn't about that. It was about the design promise of Fallout is that even in a post-apocalyptic, uh, even in a post-apocalyptic world, fundamentally the most interesting part of the world is people, whether they're businessmen or atom worshippers or, you know, intelligent super mutants or whatever, fundamentally. We're there for the relationships that we build or destroy Megaton. Um, that was lost in Fallout 76. And when it stopped chasing that design goal, even though it had the same aesthetics, Fallout 76, Fallout 4 side by side, 
look almost identical. Fallout 76 is a post-apocalyptic first-person shooter with rad roaches. That is Fallout, aesthetically. Fallout 76 sold 1.4 million units. Fallout 4 sold 12 million units in the 24 hours after launch. Because they lost their why. I don't know what gets you out of bed. I, I don't I don't know why you're listening to me instead of napping or or kissing someone or studying the blade. I don't know why you put in the work to get the technical skills that you have to be at the Technically Games Conference. I don't know why you decided to get into games when your schoolmates make $150,000 a year selling squiblets. I don't know why you make things hard for yourself, why you are, why you are playing life uh, on, a, on a Dark Souls mode. I don't know, but I can tell you that that is the reason, that is the thing that you should assess your games against. If Fallout has taught me anything, it's that it's what the audience will assess your game against. Not the audience, your audience. Because they're going to be the people that believe in the same things that you do. If you want to understand why, why you make your games, you look at your design goals. If you want to tell someone how to make your game, you tell them your design goals. And at the end of it all, if you want to know if the game you made was any good, you look at your design goals. My name is Sydney Chris Bowden. You can find my work at waxwingsgames.com. Uh, I hope that whatever got you out of bed today, whatever excites you about games, I hope that gets you out of bed tomorrow. It's been a real pleasure to be here. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sydney, for your talk. I definitely got out of bed for a great many things, including running this conference. And it's always nice to have a whole bunch of lovely ideas that have come to mind about how I love my favorite games and loathe them, um, especially when it comes to uh, some of the interesting design decisions that they made. Um, I can't criticize. I am a producer by trade. I am not, uh, I wish I was a designer, but um, I just like being able to tell people that they can believe in themselves and they can do whatever they want to as long as they put their mind to it. And I think that's uh, the one thing that gets me up in the morning, at least. Um, but very much appreciate your talk, Sydney. And I hope that if anyone actually had any questions for them, um, I'm sure that they'll love getting DMs in their Twitters while Twitter still exists or any other means possible. Yeah, absolutely. I'm going to be um, hanging out on the Discord um, for the next 30 minutes that Twitter exists. You can definitely reach me there. Or as I said, um, uh, waxwingsgames.com uh, or, or Sydney at waxwingsgames.com. Um, both will get to me. And uh, yeah, I, I would I would love to talk about this because this is my why, right? The That exciting little bubbly feeling that you get when you talk about games. That's why I do what I do. Outstanding. Well, very much appreciate your time and I hope you have a wonderful rest of the conference. Thank you. I can't wait. The talk's been so good so far. I can't wait to catch the next ones.